thanks guys again for coming. I know COVID has really um, complicated matters for all of us, but I really appreciate your Vet Life for Live audience as she likes to engage. So I really appreciate that you all took the time and, and came over. So uh, the screening is happening. We have about 200 registrants, 250 registrants screening. So, so think of a question to make it look bigger. <laughs> Ryan, is Ryan back there yet? You ready? Give it one more minute and we'll get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Diversity Series Lecture for International Women's Day. We have a special guest in the name of Yvette McGee Brown coming to speak to us and I'd like to introduce Yvette to you in just a moment, but I wanna tell you just a little bit about who she is um, prior to her taking the stage and having this conversation with you today. Yvette graduated from The Ohio State University, I'm sorry, the Moritz Law College. <laughs> Um, and she graduated from OU prior to that in journalism and public relations. And her Juris Doctorate here then from the Ohio State University College of Law, she received Distinguished Service Award from the Ohio State University, the inaugural Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Alumni Award from the Ohio State University at Moritz College of Law, and the Medal of Merit from Ohio University. She has honorary degrees from Urbana University, Ohio Dominican University, and Wilberforce University. The reason that I chose to bring Yvette here today was really in response to and in light of the nomination of the first black female Supreme Court justice that was made last week. We actually planned this prior to last week, week before, before the announcement was made. But oh, Yvette has been the first, or was the first, Ohio Supreme Court Justice. So she's going to come and give some commentary on what to expect um, with a new Supreme Court Justice, particularly in the um, person of an African American woman. And further, what we can look for um, as the year rolls out in this um, role that, that uh, will be taken up by the first black female. So without further ado, Yvette, would you like to come in? You can either grab the handheld there or the handheld here either way. Okay. Oh, so happy International Women's Day, everybody. And Karen is my longtime friend. I think I pledged her when she was here at Ohio State. So. <laughs> So uh, when she asked me, of course, I said, yes, this is my second and hopefully last speech of the day for International Women's Day. But um, I, I'm pleased to be with you and to talk about uh, Judge Katinji Brown Jackson. You know, I thought I'd, I'd start off by really giving some context. And I hope either the people watching or you here will have questions. Because as one of my Canadian friends like to say, um, America just has an issue with race. <laughs> we <laughs> And we just can't seem to get past it. Um, and you know, last, on February 26th, I think it was a week ago, uh, Friday, when uh, the president announced Kat uh, Judge Katenji Brown Jackson, it was just such an amazing time. Uh, it, was, it was a great time to be a black woman lawyer in America, but to see her step up, a woman who is enormously qualified, right? It's not, it's not like she just went to law school. She went to Harvard, both undergrad and um, for law school. And as I said to, uh, when I was doing an interview with ABC News, I said, and it's not just that she went to Harvard, she was the editor of the Law Review. 
So here is a woman who, quite honestly, is more qualified than several of the justices sitting on the court. She also has more judicial experience than at least four of the current members of the United States Supreme Court. And yet, when people um, of a different political party, many of them talk about her, they try to um, reduce her to a caricature by saying that, well, you know, the president should not have said he was going to nominate a black woman because there's so many qualified jurists, blah, 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 blah. Well, the former president, during his campaign and after he was elected, used to walk around with a list in his pocket where he would say, I am going to nominate somebody off of this list, which is a list of Federalist judges. And so this will be the next Supreme Court justice will come from this list. And somehow, that was not offensive. But saying that we're going to nominate a black woman to the court is. So in that context, I wanted to just share a bit with you about um, some of our, our um, history, because on Sunday, uh, we commemorated the anniversary of the uh, Bloody March in Selma, uh, Selma to Montgomery. And I remember uh, one of the speeches I love that Dr. King gave is he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And quite honestly, I kept, I thought until the last five years that it was bending toward justice, right? And then it feels as if we are taking some steps back. And for the life of me, I find it uh, perplexing to be explaining things to my children that my mother and grandmother had to explain to me. Um, so when Dr. King spoke these words in 1965, um, following the bloody Selma to Montgomery march, um, he was foretelling a promise he believed that it would not be long before America would live up to the promise of equality for all of its citizens, including black citizens. Sunday was the 57th anniversary of that march, um, and here we are. As you know, the 1960s was a flurry of activity from school desegregation to voting rights, housing and accommodations in employment laws to prevent discrimination and of course the war on poverty. And at that point, I was, I was born in 1960 and so in that point, my grandmother, my mother was hopeful that the arc was bending. But now almost 60 years later, of course, it feels like it may be straightening just a tad. So think about this. When President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, it was six years after the United States Supreme Court said in Dred Scott versus Sanford in 1857 that a black man could not be a citizen of these United States and therefore he had no rights a white man was obligated to respect. In Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, the United States Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal was the law of the land. A decision that led to black people living in segregated communities with inferior housing, increased lynching, inferior education, and basically enshrining all black Americans to second class citizenship. That decision would stand for 58 years until Thurgood Marshall, who was trained by one of my heroes, Charles Hamilton Houston at the Howard University School of Law. Um, Thurgood Marshall went state to state filing lawsuits to gather the evidence that the state was not providing separate and equal, only separate. And when Plessy versus Ferguson came out, Charles Hamilton Houston built a generation of scholars. Interestingly, and I think it's prophetic for the young people that live today, he said, we're not gonna march, we not gonna burn stuff, we gonna play it by their rules. We are gonna play the game by their rules. And they went state to state, starting in Maryland, where Thurgood Marshall went to law school, or went to college. 
And they went to each of those states, they looked at the separate schools, and they built a cadre of case law showing that those schools were not separate and equal, but just separate. Culminating in the 1954 United States Supreme Court decision that public the segregation in public education was unconstitutional almost 100 years after the Dred Scott decision. Now, what many people don't know, that when Brown versus the Board of Education was argued the first time, Thurgood Marshall did not expect victory. In fact, if you read his biography, he was not very pleased with his performance before the high court. In 1896, the Supreme Court voted eight to one to declare segregation constitutional, and Thurgood Marshall knew that he was challenging a century of precedent, but he still believed, as Dr. King had stated, that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice. So the Supreme Court, when Thurgood Marshall argued the first time, Brown versus the Board of Education, was deeply divided. And in an unusual move, they ordered the case to be re-argued. That just didn't happen, and today rarely happens. But this is how the arc of the moral universe started to bend toward justice. In the intervening months before the second oral argument, Chief Justice Fred Vinson died. He was a strong segregationist. And the president appointed Chief Justice Earl Warren to the court. And Earl Warren worked each of his colleagues because he thought it was important that the decision finding segregation unconstitutional be unanimous. And he went to every justice and he worked. And having been on this, the Ohio Supreme Court, I know how that process is. You know, you go to the justice, you say, what will it take for you to join this decision? What sentence do I leave out? What sentence do I add? And Chief Justice Earl Warren worked each of his colleagues because he knew how important it was. The country would be divided if it came out as a 5-4 decision. So he desperately wanted a unanimous decision. And that is what he got, the arc of the moral universe. Because had Chief Justice Vinson lived, it is likely there would have been a different decision. And I don't know about you, but over the last few years, I've been thinking about what Plessy versus Ferguson did to this country. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine where we would be as a country, the talent we would have produced, the mass incarceration we would have avoided, the people who would not have been lynched and could have had children that contributed to this country? Imagine where we would be if the United States Supreme Court had not said that segregation was constitutional in this country. And yet, I grew up accepting that's how it was. My grandmother would just say, we live here, they live there. Just accepted that. But my grandmother, even though she was born in 1906 in Macon, Georgia, grew up in the segregated Jim Crow South, still believed, she still believed, despite all evidence to the contrary, that America would one day live up to its promise and that her children and grandchildren would experience a different life, a different lived experience than she did. And my grandmother didn't have a lot of formal education, but she was wise. And she would always say to us, um, you go to school and you learn everything those people have to teach you because once they've taught it to you, they can never take it away. And I was, fortunate that I liked school and did well in school, and so I had teachers that invested in me. My grandmother lived long enough because she had eight children. My mother was her seventh, so I didn't get as much time with her as some of my cousins. But she did live long enough to see me graduate from law school and pass the bar. And there are so many times I wish that she could have been there on the day that I was sworn in as Ohio's first black uh, woman Supreme Court justice. 
And I can remember on that day, and I've, had a, I've done a lot of interviews since the announcement of Judge Jackson, and people always ask me, you know, what was that feeling like? What, what did I think it meant for Ohio? Because let's not kid ourselves, Ohio has had 161 Supreme Court justices. 12 have been women, and four have been black. Um, and I, I've said to the reporters, um, I'm not a person who gets <laughs> emotional. My children will tell you they're scarred because of that. <laughs> and I certainly don't get emotional in public. But I remember that day, it was January 8th, 2011, and it was freezing outside. Um, and I was shocked. We had it at the Martin Luther King Center, because you know you never want to have more space than people. But I, I thought if we filled up the Martin Luther King Center, that would be great. There were buses outside. There had been two buses that came from Cleveland, a bus that came from Cincinnati. It was freezing, and people were standing in line to come in. We had to have an overflow room. And I remember standing up, looking out at that crowd, and in that moment, <laughs> the tears just started coming because it was in that moment that I realized that it wasn't really about me, it was about all of them. Like those people came because it's what they had worked for, for decades, for their life. And so many people that um, we will never be able to say thank you, that allow us to sit in the places where we sit. Um, people who we don't know, but who just kept working because when you're sick and tired, you're sick and tired. I, I commented to somebody years ago that I don't know if I would have been brave enough to uh, do the, the summer of voting when those young people went to the South to register people to vote. And I certainly don't know that I would have allowed my children to go. I would have been terrified for them. And somebody said something to me that I will never forget. She said, you know, it's hard to judge it from where you sit now. She said, but I think when you have lived so long under oppression, you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so you don't have anything to lose, even your life, if it means fighting to get something better for you and your children. Um, and those are the people that allow all of us to be in this room. So on February 22nd, President Biden announced his choice for the United States Supreme Court. She will be, if she is confirmed, which I hope she will be, the first black woman to sit on the court in 233 years. The court was founded in 1789. Think about this, 233 years. We've had 115 justices in that time. Of those 115 justices, all but seven have been white men. All but seven. It is, um, it, it, it is beyond comprehension that a court that makes decisions that impact all of America is composed of people who represent less than half of America. So if we are going to have a court that purports to make decisions that impact all of us, the court should look like more of us. I don't think that's an illegitimate goal at all. Because no matter what people say, I, I love when people get into this conversation about activist judges and conservative judges and originalist judges, because that's just a bunch of BS, right? We all bring our lived experience into the deliberation room. I have one of my, the associates in Cleveland is an originalist. He clerked for Justice Alito in the United States Supreme Court. And when I'm in Cleveland, we'll get into these debates sometimes. Listen, you can't convince me about original. The originalist theory means you interpret the United States Constitution in the context of when it was written. And as I always say to Jim, if I do that, then I'm not a person. So it's impossible for me <laughs> to interpret the Constitution in its original frame because its original frame said that all men are created equal. And yet women couldn't own property and black people were three-fifths of a person. So you must understand my confusion at trying to interpret a document <laughs> that does not give me the equality the very first sentence of the document purports to convey. And when you start talking about liberal versus 
or liberal versus conservative, <laughs> it's so crazy, right? Because in 1896, you had eight white men based on their lived experience, write segregation into the United States Constitution. That is insanity. And so now we have a case challenging abortion saying that, you know, a right of privacy isn't written into the Constitution. So my, uh, my humble analysis of all of this liberal or conservative activist or um, uh, originalist text, it just happens to be what side of the issue you sit on. Because if the issue's decided your way, you think that's what the law requires. And for 233 years, this country has been happy with the only lived experience representing and interpreting that law being white men. That's a double standard, and it is not appropriate. And I don't have, I will shout it from the rooftops every time the news media calls, I will tell them that I think it's time that our court look more like America. So we have somebody who is, like I said before, eminently qualified, and I used to make this joke about President Obama, that when you're the first, you can't have them be able to say nothing about you, like, right? When you're the first, you gotta come up and they look at your record and they like, oh, okay, I got nothing, right? <laughs> It's spotless, like he had a black wife, he had black children, didn't have no outside children, <laughs> you know? So that's, that's really, that's who you want to be your first. And I know there was this whole debate um, pushed by Representative Clyburn um, about, well, we got too many Ivy League people on the, everybody on the court is from Harvard or Yale. We need to have somebody who's from a state law school to show that these are just regular people so that kids can aspire to, to be a Supreme Court justice. And I'm not mad about that. I mean, I went to Ohio, the Ohio State University. And as I said to somebody, I think I'm, I'm plenty smart. But I'm going to tell you what, Judge Jackson, she really smart. <laughs> she really smart. And I, I, I mean, I think if you give me enough time, as I say to students, I, I think you can learn anything if you're willing to keep your butt in the chair until it comes to you, right? You keep your butt in the chair, you just keep studying until you know it. But what I want most in my United States Supreme Court justice, my first black woman on the court, what I want most is that she is going to be able to use her intellect to argue the law with people who see the law very differently than she does. So the fact that she went to Harvard, for me, when they go into that deliberation room, puts her right here with them. They can't say nothing. They can't make no snide remarks. They can't, she, she's got better qualifications than more than half of them, right? She's right here with them. And what I know for certain, having watched her opinions, you guys may not remember this, but because it involves one of my former partner, one of my current partners who uh, uh, was uh, in the uh, Trump administration, I can say this because I was so proud when I read the decision. He's back now, and I told him um, that I was going to be doing interviews supportive of the judge, so he was just going to deal with it. But uh, one of my partners is Don McGahn, who used to be the White House counsel, and um, when Don McGahn uh, tried not to testify uh, before Congress, the case went before um, Judge uh, Jackson, Judge Brown Jackson, and <laughs> you may recall there was some press because she wrote in her opinion, in this country, we have presidents, not kings. And I was like, you go girl, right? She, she has the intellectual acumen, the training, the precision of brilliance that she's gonna be able to argue her case profoundly. And what I know will happen is that even when she's on the losing side, she will write a dissent that will set the path, set the tone for the cases that come after. So in that way, we are very lucky. I brought this book with me. If you haven't read it yet, it's called The Color of Law. It's written by Richard Rothstein. He is a professor Oh, no. He is a fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and an emeritus senior fellow at the Thurgood Marshall Institute at the NAAC, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. This book, it goes back to the point I was saying earlier about how the laws of this country kept black people in a second-class citizenship. It is profound. Many of you have probably read or listened to the 1619 Project that shows how 
men, black men who fought in World War II came back in uniform. One man was beaten so badly he was blind because he refused to move to the back of the bus after serving his country, risking his life in Europe. He comes back to an America that puts him in a second class citizenship. There was just an, a recent, another recent article, we've read them all about Jesse Owens, who even when he went here, had to live off campus because we would not allow him to live in the dorms. So those are the sacrifices of people that they have suffered the degradation and still never stop serving, never stop pushing forward. So get this book, The Color of Law. It is, it is a, um, there's so many times I have gone back to it because it talks about, you know, every state in this country, it talks about the redlining, how black men could not get the benefit of the VA loan to buy houses. And what is, most of us have our wealth from our houses. It, it shows you that the government was complicit um, in keeping black people in a second class citizenship. There was one, I was on a panel with uh, Judge Monty Marbley and I remember he said this, we were talking about this book and he said, you know, there was a time when I used to believe the government was rooting for my success. I don't know that kids today believe that. And I think that's absolutely true. When I went to Mifflin High School here, I lived in the Brittany Hills um, area, and I believed the government wanted me to succeed. I believed my teachers wanted me to succeed. Even though I went to school on a half-day schedule, because in 1976, Judge Duncan, one of my heroes and also a graduate of The Ohio State University College of Law, he declared the Columbus City Schools segregated. And my school was one of those schools. I went to middle school from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. I, and I imagine your 12-year-old getting on the bus to go to school at 1 p.m and coming home during the winter after dark. I went to high school in the same building from 7.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And it was not until my senior year of high school after Judge Duncan issued his decision that I had a full day of school that went from 8.30 to 3, like every other student <laughs> in the city of Columbus. But I remember at Judge Duncan's funeral, his secretary talked about, you know, because they didn't have computers back then, how many times she retyped that decision. Because Judge Duncan had to have security when he got assigned that case. His children had to have security escort them to school because of the racism the family encountered when he had that decision. And his secretary said the judge, after he wrote the decision, would gather his clerks and her in the open vestibule area, and he would ask them to read the opinion out loud. And every time he heard something that sounded too legalistic, he would correct it. Because he wanted every person with a sixth grade education to be able to understand his reasoning. And so she said, I must have retyped that entire opinion <laughs> 20 times. Because you know, back then, it's a, it's a typewriter. You change one word, you start over again. And I remember the judge and I used to have these discussions because I think busing was a horrible remedy for segregation. And I, it, it decimated the city schools. It decimated neighborhoods. And the judge had to follow what the United States Supreme Court had laid out. I can remember being in middle school watching the TV news with my mom, and that's when Boston had their busing order. And these parents, their faces were red, and they were just spittle coming out of their mouths, and they were shaking the buses saying, never in my community, no busing, never, never. And as a teen, I was like 13, I'm watching that, and I, I looked at my mom, and I'm like, why do they hate us so much? And so the United States Supreme Court thought, I guess, that you could force people to integrate. Um, and I remember saying to Judge Duncan, why can't you just make our schools better? <laughs> why, why do we have to leave? And what I see as a very practical impact of that is even though I went to school on a half day, I had teachers that looked like me. 
teachers who cared about me, teachers who were invested in my success. I had, I had teachers who told me I was too smart not to go to college, who would not allow me to get um, waylaid by the cute boy on the football team that I thought was going to be my everything. You know, they, she, <laughs> they would not let me do that. They, like, took me to college visits, and they're like, we're going to send financial aid information home. We're going to send student loan information home. You are going to college. My, our coaches used to get our boys that played football and basketball and baseball. He would call college coaches to come and see them. Coaches from Marshall and West Virginia and OU and Central State, they would come down and they'd see these boys and get them into college. Because I was a senior, they let me stay at Mifflin my last year. But both my brothers got bused to Beechcroft, which then was a suburban school kind of in the city. Neither of my brothers, though, went to college. They both, they both played varsity football from freshman to senior year. And the coach did nothing to get them a scholarship. And my mother was a single parent. She couldn't afford it. He did nothing. And I don't think... I don't believe the coach was being malevolent. I just think he didn't see it as his job. Versus our coaches knew that the way our kids were gonna to get to college was through a scholarship. And so not only did we decimate the city schools, we lost that. We were introduced into environments where we didn't have people rooting for our success. We've got to go to school there, but that was about it. And so, I, I miss that. I mean, I think that um, it, it damaged not only the public school system in the city of Columbus, but it left a lot of people behind. Um, and so I honestly, I think if there had been people who looked like us on that court at the time the decision was made, they would have said what I kept saying, just make our schools better. Give us the same resources. <laughs> Give us the same tests, the same books. We don't, our teachers were great. We didn't need new teachers. We just needed to have equivalent resources as the white schools did. We didn't need to be a social experiment. We needed an education so that we could go as far as our, our parents wanted us to go. So the lived experience, why is it important? I want to read to you, in Plessy versus Ferguson, it was an eight to one decision. There was one dissent, one. Justice John Marshall Harlan, and I, I always save these words because I think even when you're in the minority on something, you have to speak your truth. You have to be willing to say what is right and what is wrong. And even though Justice Harlan, Marshall Harlan was the only dissent, he wrote a scathing dissent, a scathing dissent for a white man who was a former slave owner and staunchly pro-slavery. So this is what he wrote, quote, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country. And so it is in prestige, in achievements, in education, in wealth, and in power. So I doubt not it will continue to be for all time. If it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to the principles of constitutional liberty. But in the view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior, dominant, ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among its citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. He wrote that in 1896. And it would take 58 years before that would create a potential of reality. It's something that I, I read in this book too. Um, the Cheryl, um, what is it? Cheryl Lynn Eiffel, the current general counsel for the NAACP Defense Fund. She's quoting this book when people, you know, people always saying, "Well, I didn't own slaves. I'm not a racist. Why should I? Why should I not get a job because you know somebody else of color got a job? Or why should I be, you know, put in a bad position because somebody else got something?" And Cheryl Lynn says, well, you know, you weren't here at the founding of the country either. But every 4th of July, you eat a hot dog and wave a flag. 
<laughs> she, said, <laughs> she said, part of being a citizen is that you carry the benefits and the burdens of the history of your country. So that's really where I'm gonna leave it here. Um, I, wanna, I wanna have a conversation with you now and I want you to be well armed. Should anybody have the tenacity to talk to you about why we need to have a black woman on the United States Supreme Court, I invite those questions, bring it on. What I will tell you is this, and this does scare me in the current environment we're in. We have three co-equal branches of government. If the public ever loses confidence in the independence and impartiality of the courts, democracy will end. What separates us from autocracies and dictatorships is that when the United States Supreme Court opines on a rule of law, we accept it, even when we don't agree with it. Democracy will die if the court becomes much more political or is perceived as much more political. If you read the history of, of not the Nazis and Hitler, you'll know that the first thing Hitler did was suspend the Constitution of Germany and get rid of the judges. We have to be very protective of what we've built here because it doesn't survive on its own. And it's why I say to young people when they're like, oh, voting doesn't matter, voting absolutely matters because democracy is a participatory sport. And if we're not careful, we're gonna lose it because we have become way too tribal. We've got politicians that select their voters and we, we have elected officials who say some of the most outrageous things like Senator Kennedy said about Judge Jackson, Qu talking about she probably knows more about a J. Crew catalog than she does about the law. He said that on television. That is something that simply, can, there was a time we would be outraged by that. But now it just gets said and we just walk away from it. It's International Women's Day and International Women's Day also for black women. I just think that people, if they don't stand up for this nomination, you show me why she can't be on that court based on her qualifications, I'm willing to consider it. But if they get into a whole bunch of stereotypes and tropes, I think they have no idea what the women across this country will do. Not just black women, not just Hispanic women, but women across this country will do. We're not going to be treated as if we have no right to have a seat at the table. And I think that's where we are now. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, but it's the same thing with however the, the court decides to deal with Roe versus Wade. I don't think they'll completely get rid of it, but I think they need to be clear. I know women who are Republicans, who are conservative on many areas of the law, but just like they've been saying about the vaccines, my body, my choice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll see how that all goes. But um, now let's take questions if there are any. I'm, I'm through with my talk and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Because I just love the way she presents herself and the law and the reality of our situation in our day and time. One of the things that she touches on that I write about, as you well know, is desegregation and desegregation of schools. So I really appreciate that um, and the importance of the Supreme Court and the decisions and how they build on one another mm -hmm. and definitely having perspective from the entire uh, United States mm -hmm. is important. So I really appreciate you bringing that forward. And again, thank you for coming out. Really, thank you so very much. We do have questions. And if you would like to take a question either to the microphone or because we are in oh, such close, yeah. yeah, we can actually have conversation if you just, or if you're comfortable with that. Uh, yes, Judge uh, McGee Brown, I was wondering, what do you think about the uh, historic uh, low approval rating of the U.S. Supreme Court? I think it's like 40% and the reforms that have been um, proposed, like term limits and uh, perhaps adding more seats to the court? 
Yeah, so um, I think that the politic politicization of the United States Supreme Court is wrong, right? And I think that, you know, it started when the Democrats came after, or, or intensified when the Democrats went after Robert Bork, and it has continued to just get more aggressive and ugly uh, each time. I thought the spectacle of, of how they handled Clarence Thomas, of the spectacle of Brett Kavanaugh, I think that's poor because people are, it's like I used to say with in these last few years, like our children are watching, right? They're, they're, they're taking this in and I think it's a danger point. I'm not a fan of term limits or enlarging the court because I think to do that doesn't serve a purpose, right? So we go from nine to 11. What we have to do is if you don't like who's appointing justices, we gotta win elections, right? So I don't, if you make the number higher, you still got to win elections because whoever is the president when those seats come open gets to a point. And I think for so long, Democrats or people who believe in or like the justice that Democrats appoint have not been strategic. You know, I like to say that, you know, when Obama was in the White House, we were all doing the electric slide and the, and the Republicans were stealing state legislatures. So <laughs> you have to be strategic in office or out of office. So no, I don't support uh, enlarging the court. And I, I don't support term limits. You know, should there be an age limit? Like maybe at 90 you shouldn't be on, maybe at 85 you shouldn't be on. Like Ohio has an age limit of 70, which I think is ridiculous given how healthy people are now. And one of my friends, the Chief Justice, is gonna have to leave the court at the end of the year. And I don't know if you've been following, but she has been like our constitutional sword in the, in the sand standing against um, gerrymandered maps, right? And 10 years ago, I wrote the last dissent on, um, at a, when Ohio had its last decennial uh, maps. The decision then was four to three. I was the only Democrat on the court. I wrote the dissent as saying that the Republican submitted maps were unconstitutional, did not follow Article 11. And I got two Republicans to join my dissent, including the Chief Justice. And so now, of course, she is now again in the majority, four to three. She's joining with the three Democrats to say that the maps that are submitted are unconstitutional. She's 70, and, and she's as bright and as smart as she was last year, but she has to leave the court because of uh, constitutional term limits. So unless it was like some age, people are living a lot longer. And so unless there was some evidence that you're gonna be infirm at maybe 90, but nobody stays that long anyway. They get paid for life, so I think most justices will step off at 85, 87, but um, no, I don't support enlarging or term limits. I think they've gotta have the freedom to rule as they see fit. One of the problems with many state Supreme Courts, even ours here in Ohio, is that you're elected. And so I will tell you a quick story about um, uh, when I was running for election in 2012, we had a case in front of us involving double jeopardy. And, um, you know, we had three women in Clark County, the Springfield area, who had robbed a store, robbed a Macy's, I think. And, as, and they had a getaway driver, and as they were coming out, they jumped in the car, and there was an older man who stood in front of the car and liked to stop, and they ran him over. They were just on adrenaline. Wrong. Murder. Clearly. Wrong. But the judge in Clark County had inserted himself in that case. He had twice been overruled for improper comments and um, inserting himself into the trials of these women in a way that biased the jury. jury. So the case is tried again and comes up to us on double jeopardy. And I was like, clearly it's double jeopardy. They've now had three bites at the apple. And one of my colleagues said, yeah, but if we find double jeopardy, like, that means they'll be let out of prison. And I said, well, that is what double jeopardy means. It's in the Constitution. <laughs> and they're not being let out of prison because of something they did. Right. They're being let out of prison because of what the judge did and who had been admonished twice before. If the constitutional prohibition against double jeopardy doesn't mean anything here, when would it mean anything? Right. So I, I got four vote. I got three other votes on my side. So we ruled uh, that double jeopardy had attached, and I called my campaign manager and I was like, "So this happened today. <laughs> it, it might." 
might make a bit of news. <laughs> But my, my position always as an elected official has been, I will go up or down on my integrity. And so if that case costs me the election, I'm willing to live with that. Because I don't think you want judges doing like this, you know, to see where the wind blows when they're making decisions. So you just, and if you're not that strong, if you're somebody that cares so much about being in office that you'll rule the way you think the majority rules, you shouldn't be a judge. That's not what judges are for. That's exactly right. That's right. Thank you. Awesome. So I have a couple of questions for you. Uh oh. Okay. So let me take this off. And these just are so online people, so they might be a little. Some. Up, so. <laughs> some. Yeah. I don't know if I can take this off. We'll just we'll, we'll well, go there, back and you forth. You want to grab the one down there? Yeah. We'll we'll yeah, just go back here. and forth for. Okay. So the first, oh, there you go. So the first, um, the first question that I have for you is really with respect to. Why don't you come on this side so I can face the audience, the majority of the audience, and I'll stand close this way. Um, the first question that I have for you is being the first, all right, as the first black woman Supreme Court justice. What can, can Johnny? If I said it right, Kanaji, can, can Johnny, Kataji? I'm sorry, Kintenji. Just say Judge Jack. Judge Jackson, <laughs> what can she expect um, in the way of positive accolades and in the way of things that she needs to be cautioned about? So um, she's already started to hear it, right? People are saying she's an affirmative action appointment. Um, she's only getting this appointment because she's a black woman. Um, but I, as I said to somebody, uh, to one of the news reporters, I said, but she's had that before. She's had that her whole career. So if you notice when she stood up, because she knows they're coming after her, right? Like <laughs> when I went through my background check, I mean, literally, like I sat in at a conference table with the governor's lawyer and they went all the way back to my earliest member, memories, people in my family, right? So she knows, she's already disclosed all that. And at her, her um, announcement, she said, I know you're aware that I have an uncle that got caught up in the drug trades yeah. and he's in prison for life. She said, but I also have a brother that was a police chief in Miami. So she's already aware. She's been through two previous confirmation hearings. She knows what's coming at her. And I think the fact that she has a supportive spouse and she's a mother, she has a supportive family, she's going to have that soft place to land. Because people, it's hard sometimes being in the public, particularly when you have people coming at you nonstop. And you need to be able to go home and have somebody who can just let you breathe, right? Where you don't have to put on any airs. You don't, you can ugly cry if you need to. <laughs> and, you, and you can be vulnerable and weak. So she's got all of that coming at her. But what she also has is a young generation looking at her in awe, right? They are looking at her seeing the possible. The law students over at Moritz are thinking, wow, maybe I could do that, right? That's the other thing she has. And I think when you are walking into areas where you're the only one in the room, what keeps you going is knowing that you're creating a path for others to follow, right? And my grandmother used to always say, don't shame my name. That's the other thing that you keep in your head. Don't shame my name. And so she's not going to do anything to bring embarrassment to herself or to her people. I like that, especially the fact that even as you are, and many times you have been the only one in the room, I have been the only one in the room, and several others have been the only one in the room, especially as women and definitely as black women, progressive black women. Um, the one thing that you do realize is, yes, you're making a path for other women, but you're also in the company of all the women that made a path for you. So you're not really alone in the room. There's a lot of legacy that's following you in that room. So thank you. That was great. Yeah, me too. All right, the other question actually did come from live stream. There is a woman who heard you speak before, and her name is Ava Bradshaw. And she says, many years ago, Yvette McGee Brown spoke to a group of young women and shared something that she likes to tell her ser herself for encouragement. And she now is putting you on the spot, wanting to know if you remember what that is, <laughs> to encourage yourself, not only as um, we've talked about the hardships of being the only sometimes, but also just in your, only, your everyday living. And um, this person also has invited others in the room if there's something that you say 
um, on this International Women's Day to encourage yourself to keep going, please share it with the audience as well. Let me think about So I encourage myself to keep going. Um, I'm not sure what I would have said to those younger um, women. What I often say, and you'll have to tell me if I'm right, but what I often say is that um, my worst day is better than my grandmother's best day because of the time in which she lived. She didn't have the choices that I have. She didn't get to live the life that I live. And so whenever I'm having a hard day or, or bad day, I think about that. That really, we are, I mean, my grandmother cleaned houses, worked in restaurants, took in laundry to support eight children. Um, she was amazingly strong. And so I don't, <laughs> she never allowed, this is why I don't cry in public, because she never allowed us to have pity parties. You know, the kids now are all into therapy, which I'm good, good for them. They're going to be much healthier than us. But I, was, <laughs> I said to one of our young lawyers, she, sees, she has a virtual therapy session every other week. I said, yeah, my grandma used to be like, suck it up. Life is hard. Get moving. You know, so <laughs> that was our therapy. And, and I, I applaud you, young people. I think it's great that you believe in therapy. <laughs> I probably could have used some, uh, and maybe will at some point, but, but that's, that's really what I think about to keep myself encouraged, that there's nothing, I mean, it, it, if, I, if I die tomorrow, and I hope I don't, I don't want to, um, I have lived every dream I could have ever imagined as that kid at Mifflin High School. Everything I could have ever wanted, um, I got a husband, which I know, my mother, my mother had three kids by three different men. She was terrible at picking. And so I, ne <laughs> I never imagined that I would have a marriage, yes. much less a long-term marriage. And there are days, but no. <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, and, and I have three wonderful kids. I mean, so literally when they, when they say you have it, I have, I have had it all. Um, and so that's what I do to encourage myself. I hope that was close to what I said to those young ones. Yeah, she didn't tell me, so I just wanted to hear what she had to say. That's great. I, I agree with you, though. Um, we are so blessed um, because of the sacrifices our, our generations before us have made, even though we still face these almost seemingly insurmountable challenges. As you spoke, I was also reminded, as I, you know, I write many times on Milliken and Pinnock, um, Pinnock, in particularly, I spoke with Shirley Duncan about, and one of the things that she elaborated, you also spoke to, was the, the painstaking uh, care and thought that Judge Duncan put into that decision. And she also reminded me of the violence that was threatened in the family. Do you think that we have moved to the place that that might not be a reality for Judge Brown? I think, um, I think, given the as aggressive as racism has become, she will have, she will need, all of them have security, and I think it is something for her to be concerned about. I mean, even as a state court judge, I was a trial court judge and was threatened. I can remember having to have security when somebody, <laughs> this is a therapist. I mean, like a therapist calls me and he's like, "Judge, I'm calling because I have a duty to warn." There's a profile in courage. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, yes, my client said he's going to kill you, but please don't tell him I told you because he said he'd kill me if I told you. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I said, so who is your client? And he told me. And I said, well, do you think your client is psychotic enough to do it? He said, no, he's not psychotic, but he is antisocial enough that I believe he will do it. And I said, he said, but again, do not tell him I, I got you. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you're in the public eye, yeah, you have to face that. Yeah. That's yeah. unfair because people really do give their best talent to the public and you should not have to contend with that. But I know you're absolutely correct and I'm very concerned as well about um, really in the last, you mentioned the last five years, the turn. In education, it's been the past 20 years. We've started resegregating in, in really big ways. So hopefully um, there will be a continued push and a bend towards humanity and the bend towards justice that you spoke of if we continue the fight. So thank you. Any others from the audience? Any other questions or comments or okay. statements about what encourages you in your day? OK. Can you catch me over here? 
So um, one of the oh. So one of the things that I uh, use to encourage myself is I think that people will quit on you, but you have to wake up every day and never quit on yourself. So, you know, we face adversity in everything that we do, but as long as you keep a strong mind and a strong focus, you can move towards those goals. <laughs> Anyone else? Words of wisdom on International Women's Day. It's been a tough two years. Oh, it's been a tough two years, and women have, have borne the brunt of it by trying to work at home, take care of families, or aging parents. So if nothing else, just use the day to just kind of breathe through it, just be like, okay. And hopefully, hopefully, we're on the back end of it, because I am so tired of mass. I've spent so much money at the dermatologist with all, <laughs> all the stuff it has done to my face. But yeah. I agree. Mm hmm Okay, so the last activity, if there are no more questions, if you would please indulge me, just close your eyes. In front of you, um, while you came in, I just put up some of the inspirational women um, that have been part of my understanding and the way I've shaped my life. Um, victories and defeats. And while you have your eyes closed, I want you to think of two or three women who inspire you who are not your family, and then I want you to land on two or three women who inspire you because they're your family. Do you have those names? OK. So you can open your eyes. And of the women who inspire you who are not your family, just speak her name out loud. Just say the name. Okay, go ahead. Ellen Watson Carver. All right. And now of the women who are your family, speak her name. So when you leave the audience today and you leave the auditorium, I want you to keep these women on your mind, but I want you to keep them on your mind because they are the prop and the backup and the support and the spine of the woman that you are. Enjoy your day today. Live in inspiration, and we're very happy that you were part of, that you were a part of our program today. And please, let's give us another round to my friend Yvette McGee Brown. Thank you all.